the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People is a civil rights organization created as an interracial endeavor to fight for justice for African-Americans. The NAACP is the largest and one of the most widely recognized civil rights organizations in the United States. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can find more content like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you could do so at my Patreon page or my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Also, please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Leading up to the founding of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois and William Monroe Trotter issued a call for black men who were opposed to Booker T. Washington's accommodation and stance for African-Americans. Responding to this call, 29 African-Americans gathered at the Erie Beach Hotel near Niagara Falls from July 11th to July 14th. In their initial meeting, the founding members of the Niagara Movement adopted a constitution, bylaws, and drafted the Declaration of Principles that dedicated the group to the fight for political and social equality for African Americans. Despite some state-level success, the Niagara Movement failed to gain national momentum, and the group suffered from financial issues and the determined opposition of Washington and his supporters. In 1908, as support for the Niagara Movement began to dwindle, in August 14th, the Springfield riot happened. After reports of a white woman being assaulted by a black man, a mob gathered. Soon, a report of another assault by a black man on a white woman had occurred. Both of these incidents occurring within hours of each other and only incensing the growing mob. Springfield police would take Joe James and George Richardson into custody. As a mob assembled at the county courthouse to lynch the two men in custody, only to discover that the sheriff had transferred the two men outside of the city. The mob then turned their anger on the local black population, furiously attacking black neighborhoods, murdering black citizens in the street, and destroying black businesses. The state militia had to be called in to quell the rioting. In the aftermath, at least 16 people were killed as a result of the riot, with nine of them being black. The mob destroyed over 40 homes and businesses worth more than $150,000, which is approximately $4 million in today's money. Following the riot, William English Walling wrote an article called The Race War in the North about the events of the Springfield riot, stating that there was a need for a powerful, large organization of citizens to come to the aid of African-Americans. In reading his piece, Mary White Ovington wrote him about her entrance in starting an interracial organization. Early in 1909, Mary White Ovington, Henry Moskowitz, and Walling convened in New York and they invited Oswald Garrison Villard and consulted W.E.B. Du boys. The meeting would lead to them issuing a call by Villard to 60 individuals on February 2nd, 1909. This would end up being the official date that the NAACP was born. William Walling then held meetings at his house and the group made arrangements for a conference called a Conference on the Status of the Negro, later shortened to the National Negro Conference. It was held May 31st through June 2nd at the Charity Organizational Hall in Union Square in New York. Ida B. Wells and William Monroe Trotter expressed some suspicions about the motives of whites in taking the lead in this new organization. And these criticisms most likely led to her and Monroe Trotter being left off as founders of the group. Wells would later state that she blamed W.E.B. Du Bois for not going to bat for her inclusion, but Billard and Ovington were opposed to her inclusion. It was around this time that Du Bois would begin to dissolve the Niagara Movement and attempt to fold it into the NAACP because he felt that it echoed the ideas and focus of the Niagara Movement. 
during the Second Negro Conference in May 12th through the 14th of 1910. The name, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, was decided on. The use of the term colored instead of Negro reflected Du Bois' influence and the NAACP's commitment to the advancement of all people of color. The NAACP's leadership promoted their vision as an interracial movement by appealing to whites and blacks and encouraging contact between the two races. The NAACP aimed to secure the rights for all people guaranteed under the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. In its charter, the NAACP promised to champion equal rights and eliminate racial prejudice to the advancement of the interests of colored people in regards to voting rights, legal justice, and educational and employment opportunities. The National Office was established in New York City in 1910, and Morfield Story, a white constitutional lawyer and former president of the National Bar Association, was chosen as the first president. Despite a foundational commitment as an interracial organization, W.E.B. Du Bois was the only African-American among the organization's original executives. He served as the director of publications and research and as editor of the crisis. The NAACP would immediately set in motion their legal force in the case of Pink Franklin, a victim of indigenous servitude in South Carolina. Franklin was arrested for violating an agricultural contract and during his arrest shot a police officer. The Supreme Court would uphold Franklin's conviction and clear the way for his ultimate execution. While the NAACP felt like this was a terrible blow, it helped raise the group's visibility amongst the public. Later, in 1915, the group called for a boycott of the D.W. Griffith movie, A Birth of the Nation. The motion picture perpetuated the meaning stereotypes of African Americans and glorified the Ku Klux Klan. Woodrow Wilson reportedly called the film like writing history with lightning. The NAACP was successful in keeping the film out of several cities and the states of Kansas and Ohio. These boycotts and court battles helped illuminate the necessity of the NAACP and establish their importance as a legal advocate. Meanwhile, the crisis debuted in 1910 as the NAACP's official publication. The crisis sank to the root of black life, profiling black experiences and the patterns of racial discriminations against a changing landscape. It documented the conditions around the South and the rising tide of segregation in the North while reporting on other aspects of black life. W.B. Du Bois was the editor of the crisis and he believed the future of the NAACP was dependent on securing a fiery base of African Americans and organizing them around a common vision of political and social struggle. In the early days, many felt that Du Bois was using the crisis to attempt to take over the entire organization, and many within the NAACP viewed Du Bois with a mix of affection and resentment. Du Bois would assure his colleague by explaining that no organization like the NAACP had ever succeeded in America, and it was impossible to argue with their methods that were beginning to work. Du Bois would also urge the readership of the crisis to support the NAACP. Now, this didn't immediately translate into a rise of memberships or financial support. But by 1913, when Joel Springart succeeded Oswald Villard as chairman, he formulated a strategy that fostered NAACP's growth with a strong emphasis on local organization. The NAACP began holding annual meetings in different cities around the country to attract public interest and establish local branches in such cities like Boston, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. With their presence in Washington, D.C., the NAACP moved decisively into the arena of national politics. In 1913, Democrat Woodrow Wilson was elected to office, and Southern Democrats began to flood Congress with discriminatory legislation. The D.C. branch acted as the NAACP's representatives on Capitol Hill and led the local fight against hostile legislation. And then the crisis would provide extensive coverage on those developments. This campaign against segregation in the federal government and anti-black legislation in Congress, as well as the crisis and their protests of birth of the nation, allowed NAACP's membership to grow rapidly in the years leading up to World War I. The NAACP grew from 9,000 in 1917 to almost 90,000 by 1919.
the mass movement of African-Americans started in the early 20th century. Later, World War I contributed to these effects with an increase in industrial activity generated by the war effort that caused Northern businesses to recruit African-Americans to meet their labor demands. These workers experienced increased wages and social conditions. The city saw an emergence of black communities that brought a renaissance of black art and culture as well as racial pride and upliftment to these communities. And those African-Americans invested in the NAACP. Even though the NAACP's vision was that of an interracial organization, by the early 20s, approximately 85% of the NAACP's support came from black people. The NAACP saw this as a hopeful sign of their vision and their future, but they understood the challenges that they faced and the spread of segregation into the North and the violence of the Red Summer, the attacks on the foundations of the NAACP and their hopes for an interracial movement. While the NAACP continued to seek white support, it was clear that change rested on the backs of African-Americans. In the post-war years, violence and tightening segregation really tested the NAACP's approach. The efforts of African Americans to assert their full citizenship was met with unyielding enforcement of black subjugation. African Americans pressed the NAACP for a more aggressive approach to that violence, and this led to lynching becoming the central focus of the NAACP. Throughout the 30-year campaign, the NAACP waged legislative battles, public crucial statistics, organized mass protests, and produce artistic material all in the name of putting an end to the violence. In 1917, 10,000 people in New York participated in an NAACP-led organized silent protest of lynching and other violence against African Americans. The march was one of the first mass demonstrations against lynchings in the United States. Later in 1919, the NAACP will publish 30 years of lynching in the United States from 1889 to 1919. It promoted the awareness and the scope of lynching in America. The data in the study offered gruesome facts by number, year, state, color, and sex, and alleged offense. The report indicated that 3,224 people were lynched during this 30-year period. Of these, almost 2,522 were black. In 1920, James Wilden Johnson was appointed executive secretary of the NAACP by their executive board. He was the first African-American executive director. He joined the NAACP in 1916 as a field secretary. In this position, he would travel across the South to investigate lynching. After he was appointed to executive secretary, Walter White was appointed field secretary. And because he was a fair-skinned African-American, he was able to infiltrate white groups and was instrumental in his research on lynching. Johnson and White would work together to fight for legislative action, establish a permanent legal defense program, and leverage the power of the black vote and wrapping up their fight against lynching. For the next 10 years, the NAACP escalated its lobbying and litigation efforts, becoming internationally known as an advocate for equal rights and equal protection for African Americans and for their fight against lynching in the United States. In 1922, the NAACP strongly supported the Federal Dwyer Anti-Lynching Bill. The bill would punish people who participated in or failed to prosecute lynch mobs. A Senate filibuster would ultimately defeat the bill in 1922 and future attempts at lynching bills in subsequent years. While the NAACP was unable to get a federal anti-lynching bill passed, its efforts to increase public awareness against lynching into the 1930s led to national lynching rates starting to decline, a trend that would be credited to the 30 years of lynching and overall campaign against lynching and shifts in public opinion brought on by the efforts of the NAACP. By this point, the NAACP was a finely tuned network of branches and programs that engaged black communities across the country. What the NAACP lacked in resources, it made up for in determined individuals. Du Bois would note that the significance of the NAACP's achievements was best measured by the foundation which we have begun rather than achievements that we have made. 
when Herbert Hoover attempted to nominate John J. Parker of North Carolina to fill a vacant Senate seat, Walter White was sent out a call for information on Parker and found a quote from Parker declaring that the participation of the Negro in politics was a source of evil and danger for both races and was not desired by wise men of either race or the Republican Party. White would then secure a invitation to testify at Parker's nomination, which led to White successfully blocking Judge Parker's nomination. This will cause the nation to start realizing the potential power exerted by black voters and the Washington Post would describe organized minorities are now in a position to wield power and influence over the Senate when Supreme Court nominations are at stake. Herbert Hoover even personally blamed the NAACP for Parker's defeat and had the Justice Department investigate the organization for illegal activities. This demonstration of political power was a watershed moment for black political power in America and served to heighten the reputation of the NAACP in the United States. In the 30s, the NAACP commissioned the Marigold Report, which was done by Nathan Marigold. It would produce a plan for a legal campaign against segregation. The Marigold Report would attack the doctrine of, of separate but equal by challenging the inherent inequality of segregation in publicly funded and primary and secondary schools. This would become the basis for the legal challenges against Plessy Burgess Ferguson. Later in 1931, in Scottsboro, Alabama, the Scottsboro boys would be arrested and falsely accused of raping two white women aboard a train near Scottsboro, Alabama. Initially, the NAACP was hesitant to take on a rape case, so the Communist Party USA attorneys came to the aid of the defendants. The hesitation would spark a contest between the NAACP and the ILD, which was the legal wing of the Communist Party USA, over the right to defend the Scottsboro Nine. The fight for control in the case would end in December of 1931 when the ILD would finally secure authorization from all the boys to take their appeals moving forward. The case was a bit of an embarrassment for the NAACP and the case also reverberated issues within the black community and was a crucial moment for the newly elected executive secretary, Walter White. Entering the 1930s, the NAACP was the African-American civil rights organization of choice, but the Great Depression had drastically altered the environment. The legal wing of the NAACP had branched out and emerged as the driving force of the NAACP. It provided a means for challenging racial discrimination and pushed for the legal guaranteed rights for African-Americans. The competition between the Communist Party USA and the NAACP for cases also led the surge of legal activity. In 1935, Walter White forged a relationship and recruited Charles Houston as the NAACP chief's counsel for their legal office. Houston was Howard University's law school dean. He had transformed Howard Law Schools from a non-accredited night school into a full-time accredited program. Houston understood the economic challenges and the social landscape of the 30s and the challenges faced by African Americans. He felt that the Scottsboro case revealed a complete failure of the Southern judicial system and also showed the necessity to take the fight beyond the courtroom and to the court of public opinion with public exposure, mass protests, and political pressure. Houston even contributed money to ILD and provided legal assistance, but he believed that the NAACP was the best platform for long-term change for African Americans and developed a strategy for a fight against school segregation based on the Marigold Report. The NAACP would struggle financially during the Great Depression and would even perched on the edge of bankruptcy. Similar organizations had issues with money, but the NAACP was dependent on a segment of the population that was hardest hit by the economic collapse. Black unemployment was twice as high as white unemployment and almost 60% in some cities. The NAACP's membership fell to just 20,000, while demands for their help almost doubled. During this time, William Rosenwald and Herbert Lehman were critical with their infusion of funds from philanthropists and businessmen. Walter White's elevation to executive secretary only served to make matters worse because many members had their doubts about him. W.E.B. Du Bois viewed Walter's ascension as a disaster, and this put these two men at odds. 
During the 30s, the Crisis Magazine's readership had dwindled to just 19,000 with a steady decrease in advertising dollars. This made White push for more oversight into the crisis, with the boys claiming that he and the magazine were inextricably linked. In 1931, White recommended that business operations of the crisis be taken over by the NAACP and that the field office and the editor were not bringing in enough money to justify their salaries. In 1934, Du Bois would shock everyone when he wrote that the thinking of the colored person in the United States should stop stampeding the word separation. Du Bois asked black people to embrace segregation and close ranks around themselves. Walter White would counterpoint this by stating that his views were not the views of the MAACP. In 1934, the board would vote to forbid officers from criticizing fellow officers in the crisis without the board's approval. This conflict and financial issues from the Great Depression would lead to Du Bois tendering his resignation. In 1939, the board of directors would spin off the Legal Defense Fund for tax purposes while it would continue to function as the NAACP's legal department. During the 40s, the federal court system was more open to lawsuits regarding constitutional rights. This meant that change could come from the courts that would be impossible with congressional action. Lawsuits against the federal government would become a pattern of modern civil rights litigation. In the fall of 1940, Charles Houston would resign from his position as special counsel and would pass the torch to his protege, Thurgood Marshall. By this point, the NAACP's legal campaign had eclipsed the anti-lynching campaign as the defining element of the NAACP. Meanwhile, during the Depression, this had caused the NAACP to focus some of its efforts on economic justice. The war mobilization caused by America entering World War II in 1941 meant that the NAACP had to work to meet the new demands of a rapid shift in the economic landscape. Walter White met with Franklin Delano Roosevelt to discuss outlawing racial discrimination in the armed forces, defense industries, and agencies created by the New Deal. Roosevelt ultimately agreed to open thousands of jobs to Black workers when A. Philip Randolph, in collaboration with the NAACP, threatened a march on Washington in 1941. One of the more promising developments of these war years was the emergence of a sustained effort to reclaim reenfranchisement in the South. The NAACP expanded its field work deeper into the South to assist the increasing number of African Americans determined to exert their civic rights. And this led to a tremendous growth in membership. The NAACP recorded 600,000 members by 1946. By 1950, the NAACP was still under the vision of Charles Houston's approach to Plessy versus Ferguson, and it was a slow moving forward, resisting the urge to overreach. The NAACP moved case by case, year by year, in a strategy to undermine the doctrine of separate but equal. Under this slow approach, the NAACP pursued litigation that would clearly demonstrate separate educational resources for black students were unequal to those of whites. Houston's blueprint pushed Plessy versus Ferguson's edges rather than overturn it outright. NAACP's lawyers argued for equal resources rather than abolish segregation completely. But by this time, NAACP's leadership felt that it was time for a more aggressive approach. This led to the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, headed by Thurgood Marshall, to enter a new era of litigation. There would be no more nudging against Plessy versus Ferguson. The time had come to try to topple it completely. It was an exceedingly ambitious goal given race relations in the United States. The stakes were immense. If the NAACP were to lose in the highest court of the land, Plessy versus Ferguson, we would be reaffirmed and they may never get another shot. This change in approach led to a 1951 class action lawsuit against the Board of Education of the city of Topeka, Kansas. The public school district of Topeka, Kansas refused to enroll the daughter of a local black student, Oliver Brown, at the school closest to his home. Instead, required her to ride a bus to a segregated black school that was further away. Unlike school districts in other states involved in other cases, in Topeka, the lower courts found that segregated schools were substantially equal with respect to buildings, 
transportation curricula and educational qualifications to teachers. Hence, the involvement of the Supreme Court cases findings hinged on the matter of only segregation. Brown and 12 other local black families in similar situations then filed a class action lawsuit in the United States federal court system against Topeka Board of Education, alleging that the segregationist policies were unconstitutional. Then the Brown case and four other cases related to school segregation first came before the Supreme Court in 1952. The court then combined them into one case under the name Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka. In its decision issued on May 17, 1957, the court declared that it was the opinion by stating that segregated public education was inherently unequal. They stated that in the conclusion in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and other similar situations whom his actions were brought are by reason of segregation complaint of deprived of equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Brown versus the Board of Education is considered a cornerstone of civil rights history and the success of Brown galvanized the NAACP and civil rights activists and increased efforts to end institutional racism in American society. But in the aftermath of the Supreme Court's decision, resistance to the school segregation mounted with a wave of defiance that engulfed the South. Southern states enacted a battery of laws to dull school desegregation and crippled the NAACP. President Eisenhower refused to endorse the Brown decision and privately opposed it, stating that he didn't believe that you could change the hearts of men. By 1956, Southern states mounted an all-out war against the NAACP. Five states required the NAACP to register and provide membership lists. Refusal to abide by a court order led to the NAACP being banned from the state of Alabama for almost a decade. Southern states enlisted the IRS to investigate the NAACP's tax status, and six states even had laws with criminal penalties for stirring up litigation, and most states established investigation committees designed to expose the NAACP's activities and publicly identify and harass their members. In the state of South Carolina alone, the NAACP's membership dropped from 8,000 to just 2,200, and many branches were disbanded and resurrected as new organizations, like the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights or the Orangeburg Movement for Civic Improvement in South Carolina. The implementation of civil rights was a slow, painful, and often wrought with violence. NAACP's members were subject to harassment and violence. In 1951, Harry T. Moore's house was bombed. And in 1962, a mega effort was assassinated by a sniper in front of his house. These are just two of the many cases against NAACP and its staff and members. This led other organizations moving to the forefront by the 60s and walking in the same ground that the NAACP had tilled before them. During this time, the NAACP received a lot of criticism for its strategy and working too rigidly within the judicial system, rather than focus on more direct methods favored by other civil rights organizations. Still, the NAACP, led by Roy Wilkins after Walter White passed away in 1955, collaborated with A. Philip Randolph to organize and plan the historic March on Washington in 1963. In the following year, the NAACP helped accomplish what seemed like an insurmountable task in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the NAACP provided legal representation and aided members of other civil rights organizations. When the Freedom Riders traveled to Mississippi to register black voters and challenge Jim Crow policies, the NAACP posted bail for hundreds of members throughout the 60s. Today, the NAACP is focused on such issues as inequality in jobs, education, health care, and criminal justice reform. The group has pushed for the removal of Confederate flags and statues from public property. And in 2021, the NAACP has more than 2,200 branches and almost 500,000 members. Thank you. This has been One Mike Black History. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so at my Buy Me Coffee or my Patreon in the description below. Also, please support my YouTube channel and give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Peace.